This lecture will focus on the earliest lineage of arthropods, the chelicerates. So we're in our arthropods now, and we covered the basics of arthropods in the last lecture. But in this lecture, we're going to focus on the chelicerates. This group has two tagmata, a cephalothorax and an abdomen. They've secondarily lost their antenna. There's, given that they're the base of the clade, it could have actually been that the others uh, gained the antenna after this, but uh, if you include ex extinct species, there's some suggestion that this uh, could have been a secondary loss just within the chelicerates. As their name implies, they have paired chelicera or fangs. Another appendage that, a pair of appendages that are characteristic of the group are pedipalps, and they typically have four pair of walking legs. So we're going to focus on three major lineages within the chelicerates. The first ones we'll talk about are the arachnids, which represent about 80,000 species, including spiders, scorpions, pseudoscorpions. Pseudoscorpions look like scorpions, they just lack the tail and stinger. Camel spiders and daddy long legs. The arachnids also include the ticks and mites, and of the arachnids, this is by far the most diverse group. There are more species of ticks and mites than any other arachnid. We'll also look at the meristematids. There are only four species of these. These are the horseshoe crabs. And finally, we'll uh, talk about the pycnogonids, or sea spiders, which are represented by about a thousand species. As I mentioned, uh, chelicerates have two tagmata, the cephalothorax and the abdomen. The cephalothorax is where we see the concentration of the legs. And that's one of the things that always kind of bothers me if you see drawings, kind of cartoon drawings of spiders, for example. Oftentimes, uh, the artist will put the legs on the abdomen, but the abdomen does not have the legs. The legs attach to the cephalothorax. There are typically six pairs of appendages, four pair of walking legs, and then a pair of pedipalps just inside of that that are used in handling food. They are also involved in males of, with sperm transfer, and they also can serve some mechanosensory functions. Just inside the pedipalps, we have our pair of chelicera, which have fangs and are associated with venom glands in most species. Some groups uh, lack these, so for example, the daddy long legs do not have venom or venom glands or fangs. The horseshoe crabs have a hard carapace that covers their cephalothorax and this provides them some defensive protection. Their abdomen has a rear projection called the telson. It's this spike-like structure that is used primarily to help them turn over if they are turned over in a wave or uh, somehow turned over. Uh, this allows them to right their body. The sea spiders uh, have a very derived body shape. They're very kind of uh, strangely uh, proportioned. They have these long, long, thin bodies with uh, even longer legs. In addition, instead of just the four pair of legs, they have five to six pair of legs. It varies among the, the species in this group. So they lack antenna, and the other sensory structures vary in complexity. So arachnids have eight eyes. Uh, some of which are associated with uh, detection of movement, and they are spread around such that it's difficult for a spider not to uh, detect something moving around it. In some cases, there is a pair of forward-facing eyes that are used in the predatory species uh, that are very active predators, like jumping spiders, and they have actually amazing binocular vision. Arachnids also have sensory setae that is spread uh, all around their body so that they can sense vibrations. In the horseshoe crab and the sea spider, they also have these sensory setae, but they have much uh, simpler eyes that are basically just concentrations of ocelli. The legs are used for crawling, jumping, and swimming, depending on the habitats in which the organisms live. For example, aquatic mites have these long setae that extend from their legs that basically give them more surface area to make uh, more efficient paddles. So virtually all of the free-living arachnids are predaceous, and they have fangs and or stingers associated with venom to subdue their prey. In most cases, spider venoms are not 
dangerous to humans. Uh, there are a few examples, uh, counterexamples of that in North America. So black widow produce a pretty nasty neurotoxin and uh, this spider here, this one is called the brown recluse or fiddleback spider and it has a very potent hematoxin. So um, it, it basically causes the tissue around the bite to decay. But many other spiders like this crab spider and this jumping spider here um, are not going to be a problem for you. As far as how they get their prey, many of them are pursuit predators like the jumping spider, so they'll actually kind of go out on a hunt. Uh, others like this crab spider are sit and wait predators waiting for prey to get close enough to attack. This fishing spider is also another example of a sit and wait spider that uh, hangs out near the water surface uh, to attack fish. But a lot of spiders you know of are web builders, and so these are basically the terrestrial version of filter feeders. Spider silk is actually produced in silk glands from the abdomen. The uh, silk is produced first as liquid and that hardens as it's pulled through a series of structures called spinnerets. Spider silk is extremely strong but still maintains a great deal of flexibility. It's actually stronger than steel of the same diameter. And silk type actually varies. Some of it is sticky, some of it is not. Some of it is used not to produce the web as much as it is to wrap the eggs to make an egg case. The spiders will use it to produce a drag line as they crawl around so that if they get blown off of, say, a, a rock uh, or a cliff, they don't completely just blow away. Horseshoe crabs are nocturnal feeders in shallow waters going after soft-bodied annelids and going after some mollusks. Sea spiders also feed on soft-bodied prey. The arachnids feed by, uh, after they capture their prey and subdue it using their poisonous or their venomous secretions, also inject digestive enzymes into their prey and begin the digestive process and then using their sucking pharynx ingest the digested fluids. Horseshoe crabs can eat chunks of food and they can actually break it up first using these nathobases at the base of their legs, which are seen here. They're basically like um, teeth that are on the, the teeth-like projections on the base of their legs. They also have a muscular gizzard for crushing the food once it gets into the di digestive tract. Sea spiders have a long proboscis, basically like a straw for feeding on the fluids of their prey. And they have an interesting adaptation given that they have such a long skinny body, there's not really much room for a digestive tract there, so they actually have their digestive system extending into each of the legs. The arachnids and the horseshoe crabs have a fairly typical uh, hemocoel with a typical tubular heart that runs the length of the body with ostia for the pumping of blood and recycling of blood in the hemocoel. Sea spiders, it's a simplified version of that with one relatively simple heart uh, pumping blood through a smaller hemocil that extends into the legs. Respiration is pretty variable in this group. So the arachnids, most of them have a tracheal tube system. So a series of interconnected little snorkel tubes that can extend to individual little pockets of cells. And so this is one reason why they can get by with a hemocil. They don't have to uh, really have an efficient circulatory system as far as kind of directed motion of, of blood to move oxygen and CO2. They have individual snorkel tubes, these tracheal tubes, that supply oxygen and get rid of CO2 in each individual pocket of cells throughout the body. Others have a concentrated lung-like area called the book lungs, and that's what's shown in this spider here. Horseshoe crabs have gills. Since they're aquatic, they can get by with gills, and they have a series of these overlapping flaps that produce what are called book gills. Sea spiders, since they are so long and thin and have such a great degree of surface area and very low volume, can just simply get by with diffusion and so have cutaneous respiration. There's quite a bit of variation also in excretion in chelicerates, so the arachnids have malpighian tubules that connect to the digestive tract and get rid of nitrogenous waste in that way, but they also can have pairs of coaxial glands that uh, take nitrogenous waste and concentrate it from other parts of the body and selectively resorb um, water and other salts that the body needs to keep. 
Horseshoe crabs just have these coaxial glands. And then again, spiders, given that they are so long and thin, have uh, lots of surface area, can simply take care of this through diffusion. As far as reproduction goes, they are dioecious, and most of them show copulation. So spiders, um, the males will deposit sperm on a small web, and then they suck it up using their hollow pedipalps. And then they go looking for a mate, and, and once they find a female, courtship is very important. Courtship is oftentimes very elaborate, and this is because typically the males are much smaller than the females, and the males are trying to mate typically without getting eaten. And so here you can see a black widow spider, the female here, with a much smaller male uh, mating from the front. The males approach the female from the front, um, have to reach past her chelicera, and insert their pedipalp into her genital opening, which is on the uh, ventral side of the cephalothorax. So it makes them very vulnerable, and the, the female has to be willing to cooperate. But yes, sometimes they will eat the male um, after or even during copulation. Courtship is also very elaborate in scorpions, another form of arachnid. Males will hold the female uh, in the front by uh, holding onto their chile, and so they do this little dance, walking back and forth. Uh, the male then stings the female's pedipalp, and probably what's going on here in both cases is the female is, is trying to judge the strength of the male, both chemically and physically, to understand if he is going to be a worthy mate. Males will deposit a spermatophore and then position the female over the spermatophore so that she can uptake this for fertilization. They typically give a birth to live young, so they show viviparity. They can even show some extended parental care where the young will remain on the female until their first molt, as you can see in this scorpion here. Horseshoe crabs may delay their maturation for 11 to 12 years before they'll actually breed. When they do so, they uh, form these dense mating aggregations on uh, beaches where the females will bury themselves and they'll bury their eggs in sand with males closely following behind that shed sperm on these uh, nests of, of eggs for external fertilization. Sea spiders also have external fertilization and then the male collects the zygotes and broods them in modified legs, which are called ovigers. And so here we can see some developing eggs in the ovigers of this male, and here we have a diagram uh, showing capsules uh, associated with ovigers um, where eggs are developing. But it's the males that take care of the young. All these lineages show a direct development, uh, or if they do show larvae, the larvae basically are very similar to the adult forms, and it, it, it basically is direct development. Dispersal can be very interesting in some of these lineages. So in horseshoe crabs and sea spiders, they're pretty much just dispersing via the ocean currents. But in the case of uh, spiders, they can disperse well away from their parents, uh, who are, again, in many cases, basically filter feeders. So you don't want to compete with your parents by growing up in the same area and setting up a web too close by. And so what they can do is called ballooning, where they have these long strands of web that they uh, keep attached to their abdomen, and these long lightweight strands of web can catch the wind and carry them uh, off into the airstream. So in some cases, when you see volcanic islands that are forming uh, in very distant areas, some of the very first animals to colonize these areas are ballooning spiders. Now some of these organisms can actually live for quite a long time, so most arachnids only live for a year or two, but some tarantulas and scorpions can live for 15 uh, years or even more, uh, decades in the case of some scorpions. Horseshoe crabs uh, can live for 20 years, and again, this is oftentimes associated with this delayed maturation that they show. Sea spiders are uh, really not known about much about their lifespan. But it's some, there is some suggestion that they have slower growth in the polar regions and may live to a pretty uh, ripe age in uh, polar waters. As far as defenses, I've already talked about the fangs and stingers that are associated with venom. Again, in most cases, these are harmless to humans, um, or if they cause pain, it's not going to be anything serious, and that includes the scorpions. I've been stung by scorpions many times. There are a few species of scorpions, though, that, like I mentioned, there are a few species of spiders that uh, have some pretty nasty venoms. 
basically in scorpions there's a general rule the smaller the scorpion and the smaller its uh, chile here the pinchers then the stronger the venom so those that are bigger scorpions with more physical uh, challenging uh, chile pinchers use that as their primary defense but if you're small and relatively weak then you have really potent venom horseshoe crabs um, their primary defense is the very thick carapace that covers their cephalothorax most arachnids are solitary, but some uh, are socially communal, and they build these large communal webs, and they have intricate uh, social systems among individuals uh, in, in cooperation for building this web and capturing prey, and some of these communal webs can be massive and cover up large sections of forest in tropical areas. And even in some subtropical areas, we have a few of these, not nearly this extensive, but we have a few of these in Texas. Horseshoe crabs and sea spiders are only known to be solitary, but the horseshoe crabs will uh, form these dense breeding aggregations during the breeding season. So as far as symbiotic relationships goes, quite a few of the arachnids uh, are parasitic or commensal. I mean, there are quite a few free-living arachnids. We've been talking about um, mainly the free-living spiders and scorpions. Um, but when we really start talking about the symbiotic ones, the parasitic and commensal ones, we're talking about ticks and mites. And even some of the, the mites uh, are free living. There are about 40,000 species described, so this is the biggest group. And we really think that that's just the tip of the iceberg, that there could be up to a million undescribed species of ticks and mites. And again, this is associated with uh, just lots of ecological diversity. In this case, it's host diversity, Par parasitizing or living in uh, commensal situations with a number of different hosts, and generally specializing on uh, one or a few hosts. So here we have a tick on the top and the one on the bottom is a velvet mite. So some examples of ticks and mites. So uh, right now you are covered in dust mites. Uh, dust mites are, is an electron micrograph of one here. These generally are not going to be problematic unless you have allergies to them and so some people do have severe, severe allergies to dust mites. You have living on you right now probably multiple species of hair follicle mites living in your eyebrows and different species living in your eyelashes. These in general are commensals, so they're there feeding on dead skin cells and oils that your skin produces, but they're generally not going to be a problem for you. Um, in some cases, however, they can cause the uh, loss of the hair associated with those follicles and cause hair loss in large patches, and that causes mange. Uh, like we see in some dogs. And sometimes you can have types of mites. Uh, the bottom right one here is called the uh, itch mite. And uh, as the name implies, it can cause some itchy uh, infections in the skin. Chiggers are another type of mite. The larvae are what are actually causing itching in your skin. They don't actually burrow into the skin, as a lot of people think. What they do is instead is they're injecting digestive enzymes in this tube into your skin, which causes this hardened tube that allows them to continue to, to feed on your soft tissue as they digest it. So it's like a little feeding straw that they produce. Well, this becomes itchy, and so this is what causes the rashes that you get. And once you scratch those, though, you pretty much remove the mite, the larval form right away, and so it, it's gone. But the bite remains and um, it just has to heal up before the itching stops. If they do remain and feed long enough though, then they will eventually leave you anyway. And the adults are free living in grassy habitats typically. And again, in most cases, these are just an annoyance, but there are some uh, species that are vectors for uh, diseases. Spider mites are a big problem in certain agricultural areas where they're uh, sucking plant tissues and cause damage to the plants themselves. And some ticks are vectors for some pretty serious diseases. So Lyme disease and Rocky Mountain spotted fever are illnesses associated with uh, ticks vectors. And so if you do get a tick on you, make sure you get off as quickly as possible. And around here, you're more likely to, if you're gonna pick up one of these, it would be Lyme disease. And so you'd look for this kind of very uh, characteristic bullseye rash around the bite. And if you see this, probably should go to the doctor because early treatment is pretty effective. But if, it, uh, if you get an infection that sets in, it can, it can be a chronic problem. 
Arachnids are really widespread, uh, especially in the terrestrial environment. Uh, and they're also very well represented in dry habitats. The exoskeleton, one of the additional benefits of it is oftentimes it's a, associated with oils and waxy cuticles that can help to uh, these organisms from drying out and so they can really do well in, in hot, dry environments. Web spinning spiders, I've already mentioned, uh, occupy a very unique terrestrial niche. They're basically terrestrial filter feeders. And uh, this brings up the point that arachnids are very important keystone species in many ecological niches. On, on one hand, they provide a lot of food for a lot of other animals. So for example, birds, a lot of birds spend a lot of time eating spiders. But the spiders themselves are keystone predators for a lot of insects. And so they can provide a lot of protection and, and help to control insect populations. Horseshoe crabs um, are limited to shallow marine habitats in North America and Asia, so they have a relatively limited ecological distribution. That's probably why they're only four species. Sea spiders are relatively widespread in the marine environment, but they tend to be particularly well represented in cold waters of the polar regions. So what are some of the potential climate change impacts on these organisms? Well, warming temperatures uh, are clearly having uh, disrupting influences on the timing of breeding of many species of arachnids. It's also affecting the evolution of their size. Some of them are, are adjusting to warming temperatures by getting larger in size. And some of them, it's even changing the behavior of some of the social insects where they're becoming more aggressive. But again, these are very teeny tiny spiders and they're aggressive in their kind of societal makeup. It's not like they're going to be aggressive to humans and attacking towns or anything. So don't worry about that. Climate change can also disrupt the distribution of species, particularly those living in cold climates or montane species. So montane species are probably going to be pushed up the mountains to stay in cooler environments. And uh, the cold climate species, the range is going to be restricted as uh, habitats continue to warm. And the desert species, as I mentioned, they're pretty good at living in arid environments, but they're kind of living it on the edges of their capabilities in many cases thermally. And global temperature changes in some of those areas that are hot already may just push them uh, beyond their capabilities. These organisms have some practical implications for humans. Again, the spiders, the arachnids provide a lot of insect control on one hand, but then some of the mites uh, cause illnesses and also agricultural impacts. There's been a lot of research on uh, some practical applications of some of the products of some of the chelicerates. So the venom itself could be used in some cases as uh, potential medications. Horseshoe crab blood is actually used to help detect when there are bacterial infections associated with um, medical studies. The, the blood can help to uh, alert researchers that a uh, badge is infected because of some of the properties of the, the blood of horseshoe crabs. And then spider silk, I already talked about the characteristics of, of it being relatively strong and flexible, stronger than steel, but more flexible. And so there's some under, trying to understand how we could use this maybe as a construction uh, product to produce this artificially or, or produce materials that have some of these properties. So in review, uh, we're talking about the chelicerates, which include the arachnids, the meristomatids, and the pycnogonids. They have a cephalothorax and abdomen with typically four pair of walking legs, which are used for crawling, swimming, and jumping. They have a pair of pedipalps, which are used in reproduction and feeding and also serve as sensory structures. They have a pair of chelicera, which in some cases have venom glands and fangs. They do not have antenna and the Eyes vary in their complexity from really uh, amazing eyes, forward-facing eyes in uh, the jumping spiders, for example, to relatively simple eyes that are just a little more than just clusters of ocelli. They all tend to have a, a, quite a bit of sensory setae, hair-like structures spread across their body so that they can sense vibrations. This is the, the most important sense probably in scorpions and be able to sense the movement of their prey. They make a living as predators, herbivores, commensals, and parasites. Uh, so know which lineages do which of those. And we talked specifically about the, the importance of webs of, of spiders uh, making them the terrestrial version of filter feeders. 
They feed on soft tissues uh, using digestive enzymes, which they in inject within their prey and then suck out the fluids. Or in the case of the meristematids, the horseshoe crabs, they can eat small food and grind that up. They have an open circulatory system with a hemocell. Heart complexity varies. Respiration varies from uh, book gills that we would see in the horseshoe crabs, the book lungs or trachea seen in spiders, or the cutaneous respiration seen in the sea spiders. Excretion also varies with the uh, coxal glands in the horseshoe crabs and spiders. Malpighian tubules also seen in spiders. And then again, diffusion is the uh, main, is really the only excretory function in sea spiders. They're dioecious, most of them showing copulation with the pedipalps, and some do show, however, external fertilization. We talked about the function of the ovigers in the male sea spiders, and the uh, elaborate courtship displays that we see in some of the arachnids. They show direct development. We talked about ballooning in spiders. Some of the arachnids have surprisingly long lifespans, and they have some pretty significant defensive mechanisms associated with their venomous bites or stings in the cases of the arachnids and the hard carapace associated with the horseshoe crabs. Most of these are solitary, although there is some sociality shown in some of the spiders. Symbioses is very common in the ticks and the mites, but most of the other lineages are solitary. And finally, we talked about some of the key ecological functions of, of members of each of these lineages and the potential impacts that climate change could have on them.